Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship in the ministry of BBFOhio.com as we begin our study of Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 titled, The Inheritance of the Saints in Light. If you have any questions, comments, or prayer requests, please send those by email to bbbfohio at yahoo.com or send them by U.S. Postal to P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. And now we begin our study of Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, titled, The Inheritance of the Saints in Light. This is part one of two. All right, so before we get into our Bible study, I'm going to start with a current events update. And uh, this, I call this an in-house update, meaning it's something happening within Christianity. And uh, so we need to address this because you folks, if you interact with people, you're liable to have somebody ask you about these things. And that's why we talk about them. But the Southern Baptists have a big issue with this guy named Paige Patterson. And I don't say this guy disrespectfully. Uh, Paige Patterson has been a, a faithful preacher, and his father, uh, husband, all that. But, uh, as I've always said, heresy begets heresy. And uh, because Paige Patterson is one of these who have been taught that divorce is the unpardonable sin. And so you basically, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, Martha, but they, do, they act like divorce is something that God hates. When the Bible never says he hates divorce. In Malachi, it says God hates the putting away. In other words, the person or the act that causes divorce is what God hates. And people are careless with their Bible, so they go running around misquoting God and saying God hates divorce. God never says that. He hates the putting away. He hates somebody getting a divorce for either the, without biblical warrant or uh, the act that caused the biblical basis for the divorce. Well, this guy, Paige Patterson, he had a woman come to him who was being beaten by her husband. And he told her not to call the police and just forgive him and stay with that man and, and stay living with him even if he beats her. Just keep, keep praying for him. Now that's just stupid. Mm -hmm. And I want everybody here to understand that if you or anyone you know, and it could be a woman doing this too. I know a guy who was asleep in bed and his wife took a ball bat to him and because she was crazy. Now, if you are married to somebody and, 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 well, in any case, if someone physically attacks you, you call the police. I don't care if it's your husband or your wife. If you, if you, and I'll tell you this, if you try to take matters in your own hands, a lot of times the tables will turn on you. You'll be the one in trouble. Well, then it came out. They fired him. At first, they said they were just going to demote him and give him his retirement and everything. Now they're saying they fired him and they're taking away his benefits and everything because he had a young lady come to him when he was president of the Southern Baptist Seminary to report a rape. And he told her, talked her into not calling the police and told her she should forgive him. Now, there's two heresies. Number one, you got the divorce heresy. Now you got this false idea that you forgive everybody willy-nilly based on nothing. That's why Jesus taught in Luke 17, 3, if he repents, you forgive him. And I'm telling you, people act like it's not important. It is important. If you don't have the truth, then you go into error, and error begets error. And so I responded by simply saying that I am a Baptist, former Southern Baptist pastor. I had one sex crime committed, to my knowledge, under my pastorate by a church member. We immediately reported it to police and removed the member. He served time. I have no idea why this is so hard for some to get. A crime is committed, it goes to the police, and they handle it end of story and I just want everyone to know if you are ever a victim of a crime by somebody in this church fellowship or if you commit the crime I'm calling the police immediately it's in their hands 
I'm not going to cover up for anybody for any crime. If you do a crime and you don't want to do the time, don't tell me about it. I'll narc on you. Just write it on my head, narc. I don't care. I don't care what you think of me. These preachers covering up for people's crimes are doing damage to the cause of Christ. We've got stories of preachers who have child molesters and rapists in their congregations and they cover up for them and hide the sin, hide the crime. It's terrible. It's horrible. And it ain't going to happen here. Just want you to know that. Amen. And now we're going to deal with something in the outhouse. You see? If it's something involving Christians, it's in the it's in house. Outside of Christ, our Christian family, it's the outhouse. Amen. June, Gay Pride Month. Oh, dear. Proud to be an abomination. If you, I don't care what your sin is. I don't care if it's being a sodomite, being a thief being a liar. I don't care what it is. If you're proud of it, you're wicked. God calls on sinners to do what? Oh, I thought you were going to say march in a parade and be proud of it. Because that's what they do. And our wicked government officials will allow these guys to march down the streets of Columbus, a lot of them exposing themselves, masturbating, and some of you out there in La La Land get more mad at me for saying the word masturbate than you will the fact they're doing it in your streets. That's the condition we're in today. Well, I just want you to take note of this young lady. Her name is Jalen Hinkle. She's got more courage than most of the Christian men today. She refused to play on the United States Women National Soccer Team. Because in the month of June, they were requiring the players to wear a Pride Month jersey. She quit. Good for her. Good for her. Now all the sodomites are giving her a hard time. The liberals are giving her a hard time. Hopefully she's hearing from a lot of Christians who are saying, You go, girl. God bless you, sister. You got more guts than most of the Christian men. You got more guts than most of the preachers in Franklin County have today. That girl's got more courage than most of the preachers in this county. And I'm not even counting the ones that aren't even real Christians. I'm talking about professing Christian preachers. Cowards. She's got, she's got the courage to stand. So... This is a sign that tells the truth. This is a screenshot, but it's a sign that tells the truth. Homosexuals choose sexual sin. I don't care what your sin is, God did not make you to do that. God did not make you a homosexual. No, we're all born, I put it this way, we're all born with a sin nature. But the particular acts of sin are your choice. So we held this sign out there uh, numerous times saying homosexuals choose sexual sin. Choose life instead. Jesus died for your sin. Was buried and rose from the dead. Believe on Him and be saved. That's what it takes to be saved. And at every any homosexual, LGBTQ, whatever they want to call themselves. I was told some the other day you shouldn't call lesbians dykes. I can't keep up with all the names they pick for themselves. They have a dyke parade, a dyke march. They call it that. It's called the dyke march in New York. It comes up in about two weeks. They want to call themselves that, but dare you to call them that. You know what? I'll say it again and say it again. It's because they want to control you. You shut up and say what we tell you you can say. And the liberals play that game, not just the homosexuals. The liberals play that game all the time. So that's just your uh, friendly current events update. And I, I will not hide the fact that I, I hope that when I share this stuff with you folks, that you will turn around and go out into the world and take the stand that you ought to take.
on these things. We're in Colossians chapter 1, if you want to turn there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. I had brother uh, John Hartman, he asked me a question. I, I thought it interesting to, to, to uh, address before we get into our study while you're turning to Colossians chapter 1. He said, you know, there's these preachers that preach one verse and then they'll just go off. And I just want you to understand that uh, if you hear a preacher preach on one verse, there's nothing wrong with it if it's in the context of a uh, expository study. And, if, and even if it's not, if what he preaches is in the context. And you, you, you're to be a Berean and test what you hear preached. And if, if he hits it on the head, then it's good preaching. But it's when they take a verse and then when they preach, it has nothing to do with the verse they read. That's when you're dealing with bad preaching. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of that today. But we're going to cover one verse today, and I hope after it's all said and done, you see that I preached what was in the context, and it's not bad preaching. Title it, The Inheritance of the Saints in Light. The Inheritance of the Saints in Light. Doesn't that sound good? I hope it sounds better to you when we get done here. Let's go ahead and read verse 12, if you're there. Read that with me. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Amen? Let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, in this ongoing study of this epistle that you gave Paul to write to the church in Colossae. Infallible, inspired words of God that we can learn, we can grow spiritually, we can be encouraged by we can turn around and teach others. We can be motivated to live our lives the way you have called us to live them and to live our lives in a way that uh, would be pleasing in your sight even if the whole world hates us. But we do pray there'll be some who will hear the gospel. We have a small uh, church family here in Worthington, Ohio, but we have thousands around the world who are listening and watching the videos and learning the Word of God. And we are only one of many thousands who are preaching the Word of God faithfully. And we thank you for every single one. And we just pray we'd see the number increase, that we would be faithful. And as we listen to your Word, may we be receptive, receiving this as the Word of God and allowing it to effectually work in those of us who believe it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. After exhorting the saints toward growth in the gospel, Paul now reminds uh, uh, the, uh, the Corinthian saints, but us as well, of the done deal. Giving thanks unto the Father. The reason why we can give thanks unto the Father, if you're His child, it's a done deal. We, can, we don't have to wake up every morning and ask the Lord, am I saved today? A a am, I, am I all right? Do I need to get saved again? No, if you become a child of God, then you can then live a life of thanks. It's done. You are a child of God. And as always, Paul couches his comments on our blessings with thanksgiving toward the blesser. <laughs> Who's the blesser? Amen. And we ought to thank the blesser. That's why I said on, on Father's Day, if, you're, if your father's alive, then you should thank him and show your appreciation. But whether your father's dead or alive, thank God you had a father. I mean, biologically, we all had a father. There might be a soul out there somewhere that was a test tube baby, but even that came from a father, <laughs> biologically. And some of us had fathers that weren't the best all the time or may have had their problems. We've had fathers who were drug addicts or drunks or served time in prison and that sort of thing. But then God gets a hold of them, they straighten up, they become good fathers. And then others who didn't have good fathers, their biological father just never there for them, but then God provided another father. 
I mean, uh, and he's the real dad. Amen, Tracy? <laughs> Have you seen the cups at Wendy's? I don't know if you go there very much. We don't go there very often, but they had their Frosties for 50 cents this last month. So we made a couple of stops there. And then on the cup, it says if it weren't for adoption, there'd be no Wendy's. Because the founder, Dave Thomas, was adopted. Thank God for fathers, uh, not just the biological kind, but the one that raised their children. That's, that's, we should be, and we should give thanks to the blesser, the one who blessed us with those fathers. Of course, Mariah's sitting there thinking, he's preaching right at me. <laughs> uh, I appreciate our kids have always been, uh, well, I'll just say most of them have always been very thankful for having a father who, whether I was the greatest or not, I tried. And that's all I ever tell any man out there. You aren't going to be the perfect father. There's only one of those. You get in a Father's Day message, I know, but a couple weeks ahead of time. But that's true about any of you, whether you're a mother, whether you, what, no matter what it is. There's only one perfect version, and that is Jesus Christ. And the rest of us are fallible. We need God's help. And we need to be very thankful. I want you to look at Luke 12, 7 real quick. Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke 12. Third book in the New Testament. Verse 7. Luke, written by the Jewish physician. Chapter 12, if you're there, verse 7. Read that with me. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Brother Doug, what did you say Wednesday about your hair and God counting your... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you hear that, Doug? That's good. Stephen... He told a funny joke. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> he said Mariah's in the division. Split hairs, split ends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nope, the Lord spends very little time. He might spend some time counting beard hairs on me, but there ain't much up here. What well, they call that uh, retreating hairline. <laughs> But look at that, how it ends there too. It says, uh, you are more value than many sparrows. We like to emphasize that uh, we say this, and we always have to be careful how we say it. But if we're talking about salvation, we're talking about you and your, before you're saved, God is not saving you because you're just so valuable. He's got to have you. Um, he's saving you in spite of you, not because of you. But then something happens. When you get saved, suddenly, he no longer looks and sees you. He sees his son. See, Jesus died in your place, paid your price. You're washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. His spirit is now in you. You are now sealed with his spirit. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. And so that makes you more of more value than many sparrows. Isn't that wonderful? But don't, don't get cocky and arrogant about it. It's in spite of you. <laughs> Not because of you, it's in spite of you. It's because of Jesus. That's why we have something to sing about. You know, if you look, if you talk to someone who's in a Buddhist, a Buddhist, they don't have a hymn book. A Buddhist is busy trying to make themselves uh, good enough that they can reach the, is that the one they call nirvana? Yeah. But they don't ever have salvation. Now, Buddha, the reason why he's the enlightened one, because he's supposed to have reached that point. But very few really ever claim to have reached that point. And even the ones that do, they don't sing about it. They don't have joy. You talk to the Muslim. Uh, I've talked to uh, you know a number of educated Muslims through the years. 
they don't ever have assurance of salvation. Even Muhammad said that he didn't know for sure if God was going to let him into heaven. That's why there's not a, a Muslim a hymn book. They have a few songs that are more like chants, but they don't have... Our hymn book, look what's in there. It's all about praising the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And there's never a line that says, and praise me a little bit too. No, none of us deserve praise. But because of being saved, we belong to Jesus. And we are the, the fathers because Jesus basically saves us and gives us to the Father. And that, that is why we're of more value than many sparrows. And uh, this is a picture that Jenny took out in front Friday, I think it was. A little sparrow landed on our little sign out front. And uh, aren't those precious? Aww. And you know, God takes care of them. Mm -hmm. But you're of more value than that sparrow. You're of more value than many of those in the eyes of God. That's a wonderful truth. Because it says, which hath made us meet to be partakers. See? Sinners are not meet to be partakers. You have been made Meet, M E E T, <laughs> not M E A T. <laughs> you have been made meet. That means God has qualified you and made you fit to be partakers of that inheritance we're going to talk about in a minute. You see, we are not all children of God. You'll hear people say that all the time, but let me tell you something. When a human being says something, it's only true if it's in accordance with God's Word. Mm -hmm. That's it. You, all human beings are the creation of God. That's true. But you're not a child of God. Right. Not according to the Bible. Look at Ephesians 2.2. 2. Galatians, Ephesians 2.2. 2. This was brought up in our Wednesday night study. It says uh, in verse 2, Wherein in time past ye, that's all of us, all of us, <laughs> walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of God. No, doesn't say that, does it? The children of disobedience. Before you are born again, before you are saved, before the Holy Spirit comes into you, regenerates you, and indwells in you, you are not a child of God. You are a child of disobedience. You have sin. You are stained. And you are given over to the lust of the flesh. You're given over to carnality. Flip over to Acts 13.10. Acts chapter 13. And there's this fellow named Elimus. He's a sorcerer. And Saul was dealing with him, who was later going to be called Paul. And in verse 9 it says, Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And what's he saying in verse 10? Read that with me. And said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Look at that. So there's somebody who uh, Paul said he's not a child of God. He's a child of the devil. Why? Because you must be born again. <laughs> you, you are a child of wrath. You're a child of disobedience. Jesus said this to a huge group of Jewish, Jewish leaders for the most part. But He's looking at these unsaved people. And Jesus said this, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. So we've had the, we have the testimony of uh, the epistles to the church. We have the testimony of 
Paul when he was still called Saul. In Acts, we have the testimony of Jesus Christ that not all human beings are the children of God. Jesus said this about all human beings. Look over in John 3. Let's turn there. What, what you're about to read is the message of Jesus Christ to all human beings, all who are ever born of a woman. John chapter 3. He's talking to Nicodemus, who's a very good man, a very decent man, a rabbi, a leader among Jews. He says in verse 6, Let's read verse 5. Start with verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now let me just tell you, that's not talking about water baptism. That's talking about the water you're in when you're born of your mother. When your mother's ready to give birth to you, her water breaks. And you are born of water when you're born as a little baby in the flesh. And it's proven by the next verse. Water and Spirit are explained to you in verse 6. Read that. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Stop right there. That's the water birth. Flesh. Now continue. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. What does that mean? Read verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. You see, the Bible is the best commentary for the, on the Bible. You want to know what the Bible means? Read the Bible. Read it carefully. Read it in context. Right there you were told exactly, well, what does it mean to be born of water? Flesh is flesh. You came out a little baby. One of the most fascinating things to me as a kid, and I know from uh, Mariah and her sisters, I just remember it was a certain point when each one of them realized their big old dad, who to them, you know, when they're this tall, I was like a giant. And they realized, Daddy was once a little baby? I remember my mom saying, I'm your daddy's mommy. And I used to hold your daddy when he was a little baby. And there's this look of shock and dismay. <laughs> <laughs> you ever remember thinking that when you was a kid? Realizing that your parents were once little witty babies getting their diapers changed? That was a fascinating thing to me. Very humbling. Yes. And then to think that God came that same way. God became a baby in the person of Jesus Christ. That same way. And he only did it for one reason. He didn't, have, he didn't need to do it. He did it to save you. He came as that little baby so he would, could, could grow up and lay down his life. No man took it from him. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. Jesus gave his own life. Only in a legal sense, by the permission of God, did the Romans kill Jesus and the Jews kill Jesus. And in reality, every sinner who ever lived killed Jesus. Because that's what put Him on the cross was our sin. The reason Jesus laid down His life is because He had to, to save you. Now being a child of God is limited. Did you know that? Today, everybody just wants to say, oh, we're all children of God. For solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.